run by the Earth and Planets Laboratory of the Carnegie Institution for Science. My name is Michael Walter, and I'm Deputy Director of the Earth and Planets Lab. And it's my great pleasure to act as host for tonight's lecture and to introduce our speaker, Professor Graham Pearson of the University of Alberta. Graham grew up in Northern England and like any good Yorkshireman had ambitions to become a coal mine geologist. Graham went to Imperial College for that reason and uh, as an undergraduate where he received a first class degree from the Royal School of Mines. Uh, so he started off on the right track. Graham then moved on to the University of Leeds for his PhD where he worked with famed mantle petrologist, Peter Nixon and where his focus then moved deeper into the earth where coal is no longer stable, but in fact turns to diamond. Uh, and we'll hear more about that in tonight's lecture. Next, Graham spent several years uh, in the early 1990s as a Carnegie postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, where he worked closely on ancient mantle rocks from South Africa with Rick Carlson and Steve Shirey, as well as with Joe Boyd at the Geophysical Lab. You might say that uh, Graham was the first EPL postdoc. After a second postdoc at the Open University, uh, Graham moved into a lectureship at Durham University, where he established the Northern Center for Isotopic and Elemental Tracing, and quickly rose in the ranks to professor, and was even department chair for a brief spell before being attracted away, or perhaps fleeing, to the great white north of Canada. In 2010, Graham moved to the University of Alberta, where he became a Canada Excellence Research Chair in Arctic Resources, and where he is currently the Henry Marshall Tory Chair. Graham has won numerous prizes and awards for his outstanding work in uncovering the secrets of, of, of mantle rocks. Um, notably, Graham is fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and, is, and was recently awarded the prestigious Bowen Award of the American Geophysical Union, uh, named of course after the famous geophysical lab petrologist Norman Bowen of the early 20th century. Graham is a petrologist and a geochemist with a wide range of interests, including diamonds in the deep earth, uh, the age and the origin of kimberlites, those, those magmas that bring diamonds to the surface, the composition and evolution of Earth's mantle, especially these ancient cratonic mantle rocks, the interplay between the mantle and the crust system, and he's used highly siderophile elements especially, and especially the rhenium osmium system to both trace and to date these ancient rocks. Graham even has his hand uh, in molecular pharmacology of platinum group elements as anti-cancer drugs. But tonight's talk uh, will be entitled Exploring for Diamonds and What They Tell Us About How the Earth Works. And I'll just remind everyone that after the talk is over, um, and even during the talk, you can write questions into the Q&A uh, uh, on your Zoom, and we will uh, take uh, questions after the talk is over. So I'm, at this point, I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to, to Graham. Thanks, Mike, and thanks for the invitation to give the talk. So uh, thanks for joining everybody. This evening, I hope to spend a little bit of your time telling you something about some of the methods that we use to explore for diamonds. And in particular, then, what the diamonds themselves can tell us more about the way the Earth works. And um, you'll notice my background. I've chosen to speak to you today from within the Earth's mantle. So this, this background on my slide behind me, that's a picture of a mantle peridotite. That's, that's what the Earth's mantle, at least beneath the old continents, looks like at about 80 kilometers depth. And so you can imagine you're a little diamond sat in that background. The, the purple dots are garnets, and you'll see a lot more of those as the talk goes on. So actually, I, I joined the Carnegie Institution as a postdoc in uh, January 1990, actually. And even in those days, the campus was very beautiful. Uh, here it is in, in spring bloom, I think. And even in those days, I even had hair as well. I just put that in there for those that, that know me just to prove that, that I did at one stage in my career. But um, I was lucky enough to uh, win one of the very prestigious Carnegie postdocs, which really are the chance of a lifetime for a young scientist to to do to work with world-class people and so I came to Carnegie to work with these three people in particular uh, the late Joe Boyd, Rick Carlson now director of the Earth and Planets uh, division and Steve Shirey here who's still a senior scientist at Carnegie and they sat in front of this huge dinosaur egg-like thing which is a piece of the Earth's mantle that's been brought up from around about 200 kilometers and these 
three individuals were tremendous mentors and, and they still are. And in fact, the, the research that was started 30 years ago then still continues in one form or another to this day. And actually, Carnegie is very much like a, a, a family. And so you never really leave. And so um, even when I got my position at Durham as my first faculty job, I didn't have much of a lab. And so Rick and Steve were good enough to entertain some of my more harebrained notions. And so I came back one summer with the idea that we could develop a better way of dating diamonds. And this, this was actually of interest to me because at the time there were very few dates of diamonds. It was extremely difficult work. It relied on dating, uh, cracking the diamonds open, but actually hundreds of diamonds with beautiful inclusions like this. This is one of those purple garnets and pooling all those different garnets together. So in effect, you were taking several hundred diamonds pulling them together and getting what seemed to be an average age. And there were very few ages that were, there were three prominent ages in particular, but most people for reasons I'll show you in a moment, focused on these very ancient ages. And I thought there was maybe a better way to do this that, that, that involved some of the developments that had been made at Carnegie at the time using other radiometric isotope systems. Carnegie has a long history of being a pioneer in radiometric isotope dating. And so one summer I came back and worked with Rick and Steve, and we developed between us the rhenium osmium method of dating diamonds, which has led now to this picture, which is a re, um, about to be published in a review paper by Karen Smith, also a Carnegie ex postdoc. And I think we all take a good deal of satisfaction from the fact that this is now pretty much the, the benchmark go to method for dating diamonds. And we filled in that picture a lot more. There are a lot more new ages for diamonds. And um, these ages actually help both with understanding how and where diamonds form and in, and in the exploration process, actually. But I don't really want to talk about the work that I've been directly, uh, that I directly do myself these days. Um, actually, that's, this is a picture of the sulfides that, that contribute to, these are the sulfides that contribute to making these ages. I'd rather actually focus on um, the contributions that my research group make here at the University of Alberta. So here's our diamond research group. And I show this picture for several reasons, but, but one is to prove to you Americans that there are times in Edmonton when there are not, uh, there's not snow on the ground. And it's actually, we're lucky enough to attract exceptionally bright, motivated and very innovative graduate students and postdocs that are mostly populating this group here. And they've done most of the work that I'm going to show you tonight. And I, it's, I get the pleasure of being the mouthpiece for a lot of this work, but it's really them that should take the credit. We're going to start with a definition just to, to, to clear things up, because you will hear the word carrot a lot, certainly for the next few slides. And the carrot, as many of you will know, is one of the weight measures and the primary weight measure for defining the weight of diamonds. But in fact, it has a little bit of a odd history in that, um, so here are car carob seeds growing on a carob se uh, pl plant. And so the use of this, these carob seeds was really goes, it goes back to ancient history. The Greeks used this uh, plant and they used it on the basis that the seeds in this plant are actually, you can see here, very equidimensional and they thought they were uh, very uniform in their weight. And so, since about 1570, that this idea of using this weight, each one of these seeds weighs around about 0.2 grams. Uh, so one carrot or carrot seed weighs 0.2 grams, the idea being that you can take any one of these seeds and use it as a unit measure. Of course, being a scientist, I decided to test this idea out a few years ago, and I weighed a whole bunch of these, and there's about a 10% variation in these seeds, at least the seeds I measured. So, so there's plenty of opportunity for, well, let's say, making some cash on the side back in the ancient world, just as there is today. So th there are many reasons to work on diamonds, and we tend to focus on the scientific reasons, but I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you 
about why these are really the world's most uh, valuable objects or nature's most valuable objects. These spectacular objects come from the, the depths of the earth and they're really, it, it, it's, it's really um, mind boggling what the mass per, uh, the dollar per mass value of these objects is. So for instance, this is the De Beers centenary diamond. It was actually found around about uh, 1990. And the cut version of this weighs about 55 grams, which if you do the 0.2 uh, gram per carat conversion I've just given you is about 274 carats. And that object sold for $90 million US uh, oh, well, over, well over 20 years ago, almost 30 years ago. And in fact, the buyer is unknown and the location of that diamond remains unknown. So clearly from that, you get the idea that diamonds are very valuable. But the question is why? They're, they're extremely simple chemically. They're just set, they're made of carbon. They're the high pressure form of carbon, which we'll see in a little bit more detail in a minute. Why are they so valuable? These are diamonds from Saskatchewan, by the way, on the Canadian prairies. Well, is it, the, is it because diamonds are actually our deepest derived natural objects? The, 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 here's an image of the rocks that erupt diamonds. These are called kimberlite pipes. And these pipes are CO2 gas driven eruptions that blast the way through the earth. So here, this part of the image shows them blasting their way through the earth's crust. It's based on a, a Jurassic South African landscape. So there might be a few dinosaurs around here getting a little bit of a lung full of dust here and there. But actually, the, these rocks start out a good deal deeper than that. So this is um, a sketch De Beers put together in the late 1990s, which turns out to be a remarkably prescient image. So here's the Earth's crust down to about 40 to 50 kilometers. And then most of the diamonds populate these deep roots underneath the oldest parts of the continents. And the transporting agents, these kimberlites, and there's a great deal of controversy about how deep kimberlites themselves come from, either come from here or much deeper down here. And the kimberlites essentially act as a transportation mechanism, a bus, if you like, picking up diamond passengers and erupting them onto the surface of the earth. Well, actually, that's not the reason that, 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 that diamonds are very valuable. I mean, most consumers don't really care about that. Is it because some diamonds are very old? If you recall some of those ages I showed, go back to 3.5 billion years. So here's a little time scale of Earth here as a, as a clock, if you like, ranging from the age of the Earth at nearly 4.6 billion years to today. And it's where it's barely worth registering human appearance on here as the Johnny come latelys of the Earth. And uh, many of the diamonds, um, are thought to form around about 3.5 billion years ago, which is two thirds the age of the Earth. And we get that from this, this date, radiometric dating work that was done. Well, it's not that either. In fact, the real reason is marketing. I mean, and even though I'm loath to say it as a scientist, uh, I, I think it, it's probably, it must be on the curriculum of pretty much any business school in the world, the fact that the marketing campaign that De Beers in particular ran when they created the A Diamond is Forever mark um, was tremendously successful in persuading people to part with very large parts of their salary to buy people that they cared about diamonds, gems. And actually, the, the, the second generation of the Forever Mark coincided, uh, well, actually the first generation, the, se the second generation of the marketing phase coincided very nicely with the appearance of the first science that used these little inclusions in the diamonds to show that some diamonds were three and a half billion years old. And so the ancient age went together with um, this, this forever idea. And so the marketing guys at De Beers, I've no doubt, really earned their salaries many times over. So, so diamonds are, are clearly very valuable. Per unit mass, they're the most valuable of, of natural objects. And, and I'll just run you through a few examples. So typical diamonds, actually not bad diamonds, are around about $100 per carat, ranging up to, say, $10,000 per carat. Um, 
And here are some nice diamonds that are actually from Ontario, the Victor pipe. These are probably in the four to five hundred dollar per carat range. But then price per carat increases almost exponentially. So really big diamonds are worth a lot more than really small diamonds. So here's an example from the Karoi mine in Botswana. There's an 813 carat diamond and that sold for 63.1 million US and, and that's a mere $78,000 per carat. And so the dollar per carat value really goes up. It really gets high when we go to colored diamonds, which are really the, the, the rarest of diamonds, and to, to, to use my supervisor's old friend, these things are as rare as rocking horse manure, but they, and, and that's partly what drives their, their high price. So you can see that this is a pink diamond from Australia, it turns out it's 12 and a half carats or 2.5 grams. And when you do the math, that's $4.5 million per gram of mass. And then lastly, and this probably isn't the record anymore because I can't keep track of these things, but this is the Oppenheimer blue. And um, you can see that this, this small diamond was um, sold for astronomical sums of money, nearly, nearly 60 million US. But when you do the math, this, this works out at $17.5 million per gram. Oh. Okay. So that raises the question, if these diamonds are worth so much, how do I find a tier one $10 billion plus diamond mine? So this is the Xuaneng mine in Botswana. It's actually more like a $20 billion life of mine deposit. And so there's a great deal of interest, understandably, in finding these mines. Now, as with every bit of mineral exploration that's been done on the planet, all the low hanging fruit has gone. And even though some people are seemingly incapable of, of grasping the low hanging fruit, others are not. And so a great example of this is this is my PhD advisor, Peter Nixon here. And during his PhD, he spent his PhD in the 1950s. Here's a photograph of Peter's PhD fieldwork area. And they use these donkeys to travel around northern Lesotho, which is a small kingdom totally surrounded by South Africa, looking for kimberlites to work on as part of their PhD. So, so these days, students get given samples. But in those days, people had to find their own kimberlite to then get the samples to work on. That's no mean feat. And so late one evening, Peter set camp on some very boggy ground here in 1957 and woke up the following morning and thought that this looked suspicious. And so he started trenching the ground and he, he uncovered the, the Letseng Literai uh, Kimberlite pipe that he'd camped on top of. Now, the, the local diggers soon moved into this and we'll hear more about this pipe later, but it turned into subsequently the Letseng diamond mine, which has produced many of the, the world's most valuable diamonds and still does. And in fact, many of the, the photographs that you'll see and uh, a lot of the science that's still done on, on these, these tremendously valuable diamonds come from this deposit that Peter camped on top of. But those things have gone. And so we have to work a lot harder these days. You can't just camp on top of a diamond mine. So how, okay, how do we find the diamonds then? Well, even in a mine, even if when you found a mine, the diamonds are only present at about one part in a million. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to go out looking for diamonds. You can do that, but you're making life rather more difficult than it should be. And so diamonds are probably one of the few examples where you use other minerals to look for the diamonds themselves. And we'll cover a little bit of that. But to understand where to start looking, then we need to know a little bit about where diamond forms. And as Mike alluded to in, in his introduction, diamond is a high pressure phase. It's the high pressure um, uh, allotrope of carbon. And so here's pressure in gigapascals. One gig, uh, a gigapascal is a billion pascals, which still doesn't probably mean very much. So 10 gigapascals is 100,000 atmospheres. That's very high pressure. Most natural diamonds occupy this bit of the phase diagram in here. This is temperature, so around about 1,000 degrees C and something like five gigapascals. Now, you're probably still scratching your head and saying, yeah, fine, that doesn't really mean very much to me. So let's take a look at what that means in terms of the Earth itself. So here's the Earth. 
and a, a, a really useful fact that you should all know is that the volume of the Earth is about one trillion cubic kilometers. And so five gigapascals is round about 150 to 200 kilometers depth in the Earth. And at those depths, then we have cool, deep roots to, to, the, to the oldest parts of the continents. And diamonds populate those deep mantle roots. There are other diamonds that also populate deeper parts of the earth as we'll see later in the talk. And so in fact, most of the diamonds that are mined, we think come from about the 2.4% of the, of the planet that comprises the lithosphere here. Whereas actually as a potential diamond factory, there are huge volumes of the earth that, where diamonds um, may actually either be more abundant or locally or, or are made in other parts of the earth. But we're talking about these sorts of depths around about 200 kilometers. We'll, we'll see some other diamonds shortly that, that come from deeper depths around 700 kilometers. So we want cool, deep parts to continents. So as an example, it turns out that the, the southern part of Africa is characterized by something called a craton. A craton is an ancient, very stable, part of the Earth's lithosphere, and the roots beneath those cratons are cool relative to the rest of the mantle. And so even though you want high pressures for diamond formation, you also want cool temperatures, otherwise the carbon turns to graphite. And so it turns out that a large fraction of the Earth's lithosphere underneath the Katval craton, here's a 3D cross section of it, are deep enough to stabilize diamond in the lower part. And in fact, one tremendously successful Carnegie-led uh, uh, research project, which started um, and ran in the late 1990s through to the early 2000s, was the Carnegie-led Capfile project, which I was lucky enough to be a part of. And that did a tremendous job in mapping out where the deepest parts of the roots are beneath the, this is the same cut valve crate on here, here's Cape Town down there, north is up there, and it mapped out the form of these deep cold roots beneath the cut valve crate on itself. And that was actually tremendously helpful to the exploration industry, giving clues to, well, where else you might find diamonds. That approach has been extended to a glow on a global scale and you can see that in addition to southern Africa in fact large parts of Africa have cool deep lithosis so this is you can do this using seismologies it's the way that seismic waves propagate through the earth it turns out that seismic waves propagate much faster through these cool deep continental roots than in the surrounding mantle and so the the blue to purple colors here you can interpret as seismically fast or cold, deep roots here. You can see much of Southern Africa, West Africa, a lot of North America actually has good potential for looking for diamonds and in terms of it having deep, cold lithosphere here. Okay, so we can find thick, cool lithosphere sat at our desk using seismology and, and computers, but there's nothing like putting boots on the ground and actually going and looking for the rocks themselves, because that, that narrows a target area down, but it doesn't find the kimberlites themselves. And there are many ways of finding kimberlites, but they're actually very challenging rocks to find because they're rather rare and they're very small volume compared to many other rock types. So this goes back to the, how do we define diamonds? Um, well, we look for other minerals called kimberlite indicator minerals. So here's a diamond sat in a nice group of kimberlite indicator minerals. And we've got here these beautiful garnets, again, the purple garnets, and there's some orange ones down here, which we'll return our attention to shortly. We've got olivines, peridot, if you like, and green chrome diopsides, which are a pyroxene, and then a mineral called ilmenite here as well. And these are the diamond indicator minerals that you look for rather than the diamonds, because they're present at many, many orders of magnitude more uh, 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 in the kimberlite themselves are much more common than the diamonds that are present at the part per million level. So it turns out some kimberlites are very easy to find. This is, these are field photographs from the late 1990s when we went up to Canada's Arctic about 78 degrees north on Somerset Island. And these are probably the easiest to find kimberlites in the world. Here's our helicopter sat on top of some of the few kimberlites that actually make positive topography. And that's because these kimberlites are surrounded by a very 
uh, easy to weather, very soft limestone surrounding them. And so um, the kimberlites stand out either from the air on, uh, vertically or as you're flying by the cliff faces though. Although you always get surprised as I, I gave these old slides to our IT person to scan in. And of course, it, it, you, you, you never know what catches people's eyes. And the first thing he said to me was, so what's the feature in this diagram then? And I looked at him a little gobsmack, but of course I know what I'm looking at. And of course, these are the Kimberlites here that are, that are intruding this rather pale, boring limestone. But this is not the case for most Kimberlites. Many Kimberlites, especially in Canada, then they form negative topography and so they form lakes. So this is the diving mine in Arctic Canada. And it was actually built out into the lake here, into Lac de Grand. So this is essentially a huge dam that was built out into the lake. They removed all the fish from this part of the lake and they built these two mines here. But finding these pipes, these Kimberlite pipes, was not easy. This is a zoomed out view of the same area. So, OK, the Kimberlites occur in lakes. OK, pick your lake. It, it's a rather challenging prospect. It turns out here's, here's where the mine is on Lac de Gras. But of course, you've got to know quite a lot to, to, to enable finding the specific locations that these Kimberlites are. So we use these kimberlite indicator minerals. And this is the, I should say many of these photographs I'm showing you are taken by Annette Bernatz at our university who does a spectacular job of, of photographing both the diamonds and the indicator minerals. So this diamond is lying on a bed of, of kimberlite indicator minerals, mostly garnet in this case. So here's, a, here's a, an example from Ontario actually, um, where we've got, this is Lake Temiskamin in, in Ontario, there's two, there are two diamonds here that are the kimberlites themselves. And this is the glacial erosion plume that is coming off these kimberlites. And that erosion plume, so it basically, the, the, the kimberlite is planing, oops, planing the tops off the kimberlite and moving the debris down ice direction. And so you've got to understand quite a bit about the ice direction to track back. And these little pie charts here give you a feeling for the proportion of the different kimberlite indicator minerals. Gray is ilmenite, which is this mineral. And then the red here are these, these different types of garnets. And then as you get closer to the kimberlite, you find more of either chrome spinel or the little green chrome diopside here. So here's an example that one of my master's students, Stefan Platras, used these sorts of techniques along with another technique, which I'm going to show you in a minute, to, to do some work in the Northwest Territories in Canada. So this is an area northwest of Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories called the Horn Plateau. Here's the Mackenzie River here, which goes way out up to the Arctic coast. And so these are a series of essentially um, fluvial and glacial sediments that have been sampled for their kimberlite indicator minerals. And you can see the little pie charts indicate that close to this plateau area, there, there are clusters of really quite promising areas where the little green chrome diopsides start showing up in abundance and even olivines and lots of garnets here. So this area and this area. And so that looks quite promising. Here's a pie chart, a simple proportion of these different minerals, the green pyroxenes, the garnets, and the ilmenites. So that's great. That's viewed as very promising that there are indicator minerals around. Here's another area south of there known as Trout Lake, although there's a lot of trout in a lot of lakes around there. So the name is not particularly imaginative and doesn't narrow it down much. But here we are in looking at a pie chart of samples around this area. The pie chart, we'll have to look at the summary pie chart, but it also has quite a lot of garnets uh, some olivines and some uh, chromite and il ilmenite as well. So also kimberlite or potentially diamond indicating minerals. So how do you evaluate these two areas? They're pretty big areas. The scale here is 40 kilometers. Where do we look? And so one of the techniques that is used is to interrogate these little grains you find to see what indications they have as to what the pressures were that they were derived from. Do these grains, these indicator grains, come from parts of the mantle where diamonds are stable? And so 
there were existing techniques for garnets and pyroxenes. We chose to focus on uh, improving a technique for these minerals, the olivines here. These are not diamonds, these are colorless high magnesium olivines. And so a PhD student of mine, Yannick Busweiler, took some older experiments that had um, been conducted in another lab. These, so these are actually uh, rocks that have been cut up in the lab in the big high pressure presses, rather like the ones on the Carnegie campus to a thousand degrees and maybe uh, uh, 50 to 60,000 atmospheres. And he analyzed with a great deal of care using some special techniques, the olivines for their trace element content, in particular aluminum. And he also looked at some natural samples. Here's a thin section of olivine in, in thin section. These are interference colors seen in, in cross polars in the microscope. And he came up with, if you um, use some thermodynamics and you look at dip experiments at different pressures to look at the pressure dependency without going into too much detail, he, he created a relationship between the aluminum content of the olivine and temperature which we converted into what is called an aluminium in olivine thermometer, where you analyze the aluminium content of the, of the olivine and it gives you a temperature which we can then convert into depth. So if we go back to those areas that look as though, okay, they've got diamond indicator min or kimberlite indicator minerals there, but do those minerals come from parts of the Earth's mantle that diamonds are, 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 are coming from as well? Do they sample the part of the mantle that the diamonds are from, then the answer in this case is yes. So in fact, if you use the garnet and pyroxene techniques and the olivine as well, here's depth and number of samples. And you find out that almost all of the different indicator grains actually come from depths where you would expect diamond to be stable. And that's, that's a really positive sign. The Trout Lake example, much as it would be tempting to go there and do some fishing, you wouldn't be tempted to go there and explore for diamonds. And the reason for that is that when you interrogate the indicator mineral grains to the same degree there, you find that almost all the grains come from parts of the mantle which do not contain diamonds. So clearly the kimberlites have ripped through the mantle and in, in the Horn Plateau example, in this example, all most of the mantle sampling, most of the material they've ripped up and, and erupted on the way comes from the diamond stability field. In this example at Trout Lake, very little of that has happened. And most of the material that's been sampled by this kimberlite as it's blasting its way to the surface comes from the graphite stability field. And you wouldn't want to go there and spend a great deal of money trying to find those kimberlites. So that's a pretty useful and efficient way of trying to find kimberlites. Okay, so I've got some good looking kimberlite indicators. There's still a problem with garnets though, because what we've talked about so far mostly pertains to garnets that are these nice purple to red garnets here. But there's a great deal of interest in orange garnets. So here's some orange garnet mixed in with the purple and red garnets. Here's the green pyroxenes here as kimberlite indicators. The reason that we're interested in orange garnets is that they belong to a rock called eclogite. And eclogites that come from the mantle can contain very substantial, very enriched proportions of diamond. So here are two diamond bearing mantle eclogites. Note the orange garnet, it's slightly reddish in here compared to this one, but these are essentially what we classify as orange garnets. But more particularly notice the presence of diamonds, diamond, 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 diamond. There's up to 30 weight percent of diamonds in these rocks. And so they can actually form very large contributions to the diamond grade of any one particular uh, kimberlite pipe. And so I had a PhD student, Matt Hardman, who was actually given this task. Rio Tinto came to us with this problem because they were complaining that the existing methods of distinguishing. So the, the question is, do these orange garnets, do they come from Earth's mantle? in the diamond stability field or do they come from the crust and are of no interest whatsoever because there are a lot of lot of garnet bearing crustal rocks that have orange garnets so the existing techniques involved analyzing those garnets for the ele elements like calcium and magnesium and iron and 
So while that approach, so Matt created a much bigger database than the one that's been used previously to establish this classification. So garnets that plot within this, um, this odd shaped uh, field here, they would be of mantle origin. And so we, these are garnets that we know are from rocks of mantle origin. And so this older classification technique does a pretty good job of confirming that, that garnets from mantle derived rocks, they come from the mantle. The problem is when you look at orange garnets from crustal derived rocks, and this method had almost a 50% failure. In other words, a 50% false positive. And you can spend, work, working up in Canada's Arctic is very, very expensive. And so you don't want to spend time chasing around following leads that turn out not to be economical. And so, so Matt developed um, uh, a more probabilistic approach that used more elements, in particular titanium, silicon, chromium, iron, magnesium, calcium, and sodium. And so um, he used a technique called logistic regression, which I won't go into the details of, but essentially it allows you to address the question, if I have one orange garnet, what is the probability of it coming from the crust here, Earth's crust, and not being of interest in terms of diamond, or what is the probability of it coming from Earth's mantle? And this method really improved the identification of these types of garnets from a 50% false positive rate to a 7% false positive rate. And that was a, uh, immediately adopted by, by many of the explorationists in industry. Of course, this an artificial intelligence technique is really the way to take this further, but, but it, it, it really does help in terms of avoiding spending money following prospects where you, you don't want to find that actually after, after spending several million, several million dollars chasing around Canada's Arctic, that actually your depo so-called deposit is just a bunch of crustal, bearing, uh, crustal garnet bearing rocks. Okay, so I've got a kimberlite. It's got good mantle mineral chemistry. What's it worth? This is probably one of the single most challenging aspects in all of what we call economic geology is to estimate the value of a diamond ore body. And, and that's because, A, because it's very difficult to estimate the value of the, the diamonds that are there because that depends on their size and it depends on the quality of the diamonds. In contrast, uh, a commodity like gold, then gold from Venezuela is worth just the same as gold from the United States or gold from Uzbekistan. It, it, gold is gold, but diamonds, not all diamonds are created equal and bigger diamonds, and as you saw, colored diamonds hold much of the value in, in mines. And so we want to have good carrots. Now it's very difficult at the moment to predict the presence of colored stones. We'll, we'll maybe come back to that, but um, and so people focus on trying to predict whether there are big diamonds in these mines. And so they use these probability frequency plots here. There's one from Johan Stiefenhofer um, where we're looking at the diamond size. This is log size in terms of carrots. So here would be diamonds that are hundreds uh, of carrots in, in size. And essentially you want to be on this coarse distribute closer to this coarse distribution than this fine distribution curve. The last thing you want is to find a kimberlite. You spend a lot of money chasing it down and you find that it's it's got lots of diamonds, but all those diamonds are absolutely tiny. You, you really are looking for, for deposits that are on this coarse end of the distribution curve. And that's actually a very, very difficult thing to do. Even when you have a mine, you need huge samples to develop some um, confidence that, that you've actually got this sort of sample size distribution. <clears throat> what you're really after is, okay, what is the probability of the presence of say a 900 carat diamond here, like this stone from, um, uh, from let's say. And so that raises the question, okay, well, are the biggest, most valuable diamonds different? Should we even plot them on these curves? And actually this was a question spectacularly answered by some research at the Carnegie Institution a few years ago, done by Evan Smith, Steve Shirey and colleagues, uh, where they, they looked at, um, through, through access to samples through the Gemological Institute of America, they looked at inclusions in these very large diamonds, as well as some of the chemistry, the inclusions indicated to them that, that the diamonds were from the deepest parts of the earth. In particular, we have these 
uh, what turned out to be evidence for liquid metal inclusions, iron nickel alloys as, as solid inclusions in these big diamonds. Notice the location of these diamonds that were studied in, in, in this particular work from Letseng. This is the Lesotho um, kimberlite that, that my advisor camped on top of. And just as, as interestingly, it did the this research showed that these big diamonds actually, rather than coming from this part of the Earth's mantle, they come from a much greater depth between 400 and 700 kilometers depth. And so these were given the moniker of super deep diamonds. And so big diamonds, it turns out, seem to be predominantly super deep diamonds. So that's a resounding yes, those diamonds are different. And that, that actually, it turns out that that makes it very, very difficult to predict whether you have a kimberlite that contains these big diamonds. And so if we go back to the example of Letseng, so here it is, my advisor discovered it in 1957. By about 1959, local diggers had, had moved in and that turned out to be a big boon for bigger industry looking to invest because those diggers put in a huge amount of backbreaking work to reveal that that kimberlite had the pitifully low grade of one carat per hundred tons of rock removed. And remember, these guys are removing this rock by hand. So for every 100 tons of rock removed, they were recovering 0.2 grams of diamonds. And so you, that leads to the question, well, why on earth did it lead to this uh, modern mine run by Gem Diamonds um, that operates today? And the answer to that came in the form of a lady called uh, Mrs. Ernestine Ramaboa, who was working those diggings and discovered a 600 carat diamond. This is the Lesotho Brown, it's 601 carats. And actually part of that diamond ended up in a ring owned by uh, Jacqueline uh, Kennedy slash Onassis at one time. There's Mr. Ramaboa seemingly looking to take a little bit more credit than he was due for his wife's diligence and hard work here. Uh, but that discovery led to the notion that, okay, this kimberlite is at very, very low grade. It's the lowest grade of diamond in a kimberlite that's ever been mined, but it had the potential for these big diamonds. And that's when uh, bigger corporations moved in and industrialized the outfit. And so here's our 910 carat diamond again that led to this discovery of many of the, the world's largest diamonds and the, some of the most valuable diamonds that have ever been sold have come from the Letseng mine, kicked off by Mrs. Ramaboa here discovering the, the Lesotho Brown. So here's the $40 million Lesotho legend. So these, these rocks are, oh, these diamonds are really are super deep. They come from great depth and they're super special. It turns out that many pink diamonds may well also be super deep diamonds. These examples come from the Karoi mine in Botswana, the, these, these very big diamonds here. And as an example, further example, this is, was essentially an unwanted mine. Karoi, along with Letseng and a mine called the Cullinan mine in South Africa, between them, they dominate the production of the world's big diamonds. And the Karoi is an interesting example because it was discovered in the late 60s and had been kicked around by De Beers who come up with initial grade estimates of between 15 to 25 carats per 100 tons. Again, do the math, convert that to grams. That's a very, very small amount of diamond per 100 tons of rock removed. And they decided that they weren't interested in this mine. And so, especially because, well, the, the, this stone value is okay at 243 carats, especially for Southern Africa. But, it, but with that grade, it, it didn't really, um, light a fire in, in, in the accountant's view as to whether to keep hold of this deposit. So they sold it to Canadian company Lucara for $49 million in 2008. Now keep in mind the sorts of values that I've just told you that some of these big diamonds are worth. Well, a friend of ours at the University of Alberta uh, who works with us a lot called John Armstrong took a look, he was employed by Lucara, took a look at their diamond oops, size distribution curve and, and he, on the basis of fairly slim data, decided that the size distribution looked more like this than like this. And so, so he actually convinced management to put in a, a very novel X-ray machine that spotted 
big diamonds before they went through the crushes, because many big diamonds are crushed in, in a lot of recovery systems. Although trying, trying to get a mining engineer to admit that to you is, is, is virtually impossible, but it's a well-known fact. And so John Armstrong um, insisted on the installation of these X-ray scanners, which essentially scan the average atomic number of material going through the system. So, so sure enough, you recover a lot of the plastic that's, that's, that's used in the mine to retain face walls and stuff, but you also recover these, what they call exceptional stones, many, many exceptional stones that in the case of Karoe average over $30,000 a carat. And within a year of installing that system, they recovered at the, at the Karoe mine, the second largest gem diamond ever found, the Lacidi Lorona at 1109 carats, which was an, uh, an excellent vindication of the faith in these size distribution curves. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit on, on how to go about finding diamonds and, and how difficult it is to evaluate the deposits and to take the gamble on whether to invest. So I, I'm just going to spend the last third of the talk telling you, uh, giving you a little bit of a flavor of some of the science that we do uh, with the diamonds that are found. And you can get a lot more of that flavor, actually, if you go on the Carnegie Earth and Planets website, there's a tremendous um, new story in a, a paper just published by, by the group um, that, that you'll see there looking at deep water recycling in the earth. Um, and so we're going to take a brief look at, at how we've used uh, diamonds to tell us about the deeper parts of the earth. So here's our cross section of the earth again, with some slightly oversized seagulls. I realize now you really wouldn't want to be under one of those if it had a stomach upset, would you? Um, and the so the really the the attraction of looking at these diamonds, some of which come from these sorts of depths in, in the Earth's mantle, is that these are the only direct samples of these parts of the Earth that we'll ever get our hands on. And so they make them exceptionally valuable scientific repositories of information. I'm going to focus just on uh, something about the fluids in, in these diamonds, because they tell us a tremendous amount about deep Earth fluids information that's very difficult to get at any other way. In fact, these diamonds preserve the only examples of fluids that come from 200 kilometers beneath Earth's surface. These fluid rich diamonds are, are a little bit odd looking. So, I mean, these do not look like the, these hugely valuable diamonds that I've been showing you the gratuitous pictures of so far. So here's a cloudy diamond. This is quite a nice gem octahedral diamond. And it's got this fluid rich cloud here. These are tiny little fluid inclusions inside the diamond. They, and these are the fluids that diamonds grow from. So, so diamonds essentially grow from the ingress of fluids into rocks like the one behind me in my image background here. And they grow in, the, in that background from fluids passing through rocks like that. There are other fluid rich diamonds that, are, that grow as coats along uh, around the edges of these gem diamonds here. So here's a gem core, here's a fluid rich coat. And these are fluid rich coats on uh, really quite nice diamonds from Canada. These are from the Snap Lake mine. And the dark here is actually high densities of fluid inclusions that are coating these otherwise nice octahedral diamonds. And so if we take, if we slice these diamonds and we take a look into the middle, you can see that the dark um, entities, these dark patterns are really functions of the density of fluid inclusions in there. You can, if you zoom in, this is work done by a postdoc off of Klein Ben David. You can see that the, the fluids here, these tiny 20 micron fluids, well, this is a, sorry, this is a 20 micron view. The fluid inclusions, the individual fluid inclusions are much smaller than this. And you can see that there's literally thousands of them. When you zoom in even further to the nanometer scale, you can see there are minerals in these inclusions and the vacancies here are actually populated by, uh, usually by this, this, by water and CO2. So, so these make up the fluids in these diamonds. Now, as you've gathered, if you've been looking or paying attention to the images, you'll see that these diamonds are not particularly attractive. And so the, and the, I like to make an analogy here. Geologists like to make beer based analogies. And so, so here's one about the fluids in these diamonds. And, and really, the situation is pretty much the same as, as one. If you consider driving down, say, a nice English country lane and you come across a pub like this, this is, this is the, uh, something that houses fluids. 
and you, and you go inside thinking that the exquisite interior might lead to exquisite fluids inside. But what you find is in fact really rather disappointing. And in fact, not only is it disappointing in terms of the quality, but it's tremendously disappointing because the farmer tells you that they haven't got any left either. There's virtually no fluids in this rather exquisite looking container. And that's the case for these gem diamonds, that although they look great, they're very, very difficult to do research on if you're interested in the fluids. In contrast, if you look at this establishment, I mean, let's say this is just to avoid offending anybody somewhere some, from some, some random state like Kansas, for instance, and then the building looks as though it needs a little bit of work. Um, except when you go inside, it proves the adage that you should not judge a book by its cover. And you find that there are all these amazing fluids of tremendous quality, and they've got lots of them. And that's pretty much the case with these diamonds. So many of you would struggle to even recognize these stones as diamonds, but these are fluid rich diamonds. And you certainly won't, wouldn't really, what well, you'd think twice about giving them to anybody that you cared about, but they are really gold mines in terms of the, the, the scientific information that they contain. And so just to prove that Carnegie doesn't have the monopoly on cover images of nature and science, this is a study that we, we got published in, in Nature. Here's a coated diamond actually from the Northwest Territories, a gem core. Then all the information came out of these fluid rich rims that in these diamonds turn out to be an interesting green color. We do this work using a, a novel laser ablation system where it turns out diamonds are very difficult to attack either by acids or physically. And so to get at any chemical impurities in them, then a laser is a good way to go. That to, it is really one of the few ways of breaking these. This is a diamond lattice, the very, very strong bonds between the carbon atoms here. And so we have a, a, a bespoke laser ablation system at the University of Alberta where you put your diamond in there, the laser ablates it, and you, we trap the particles in a closed cell here, and then we analyze them. So here's, a, here's an example of that setup. You can put up to nine samples in here. Here's a little Teflon container, and the laser beam comes down here and ablates the diamond. And then we analyze the product of that ablation in a mass spectrometer, in this case, a plasma mass spectrometer that burns argon gas at around about 8,000 degrees Kelvin. So actually somewhat hotter than the surface of the sun, or a little bit hotter anyway. And at those temperatures, all the chemical elements are ionized and we're able to analyze them in a mass spectrometer. So that gives us then a, um, a spectrum of chemical elements. Now I know there's a lot of elements on here that people probably won't recognize the symbols for if you do great um, it's actually not important what the chemical symbols are the point is that if we if we look at the different patterns and the shapes of the distribution patterns of these different chemical elements we can tell something about the fluid from, from, from in, um, where that fluid originated from and even we've used it I won't go into this but we have used it to try and address the origin of the different diamonds because the, the, it's possible that the different locations that diamonds come from are characterized by different trace element patterns here. We're gonna look at a suite of diamonds very quickly from the Northwest Territories here. So in Canada, in the North of Canada, here's Great Slave Lake. And the diamond mines are focused here in that area populated by all those lakes, if you can remember the photograph I showed you earlier. And these are coated diamonds, gem diamond, and then fluid rich diamonds here. We analyze the fluids around the edges of that. This is work done by PhD student John McNeil and Jakob Weiss. And what we found is that curiously, the um, edge, the, the fluids in those diamonds were very salty, very saline. And so hence the, the nature cover uh, image saying a pinch of salt. So chloric, the, the chloride here is actually accommodated mostly by sodium and potassium chloride. So very, very high chloride, chloride content in fluids that then range in compositions to low chlorine, silica rich compositions and some magnesium rich low chlorine compositions. But the focus we had was on these salty or saline rich fluids. And it turns out if you look at other 
um, arrangements of these chemical elements here. Uh, again, it, it's not important what the elements are other than this one here, EU is Europium. And the saline or salty fluids in particular have these very striking Europium anomalies compared to the silicic fluids here. And those sorts of Europium patterns are characteristic of fluids that originate in Earth's crust. So as an analogy, this is, these are, are actually rocks from the oceanic Earth's oceanic crust that also have these Europium anomalies for a different reason. These are hydrothermal fluids that circulate in oceanic crust that have huge Europium anomalies. This graph is simply a measure of the size of those Europium anomalies versus some other chemical characteristics relative to the rest of the chemical elements on this plot. And really the, the main point to notice is that the saline or salty fluids have by far the biggest Europium anomalies. And then this really is a pointer towards a crustal origin. We then analyzed the strontium isotopic composition of those fluids. So strontium is a fingerprint of where a rock or a fluid might have come from. And, and it turns out that, that seawater, we chose Jurassic seawater here, um, for specific reasons, but Jurassic seawater has a very particular strontium isotope composition. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our saline diamonds with the high Europium anomalies have strontium isotope fingerprints that are very similar to those that we expect from Jurassic seawater. The other fluid compositions are much more varied and are dominated by the fluid interacting with the rock, rather like the rock behind me, whereas these are a more pristine version of the fluid this seems to be characteristic of a fluid that's coming from a crustal provenance that's been subducted down into the deep earth. So here's a little cross section envisaging that process. So here's our altered uh, crustal rock being subducted underneath the continent and fluids um, being essentially boiled off those that are released from, from uh, at high temperature during breakdown, infiltrating the bottom of the old root and making diamonds. Now it turns out in, in 2018, the Carnegie group showed that blue diamonds, you remember how valuable those blue diamonds are. They looked at a combination of, of the fluid, in, uh, sorry, the mineral solid inclusions in, in blue diamonds and just suggested that the boron that makes the diamonds blue is the trace element uh, boron that gives this beautiful blue color, including the Hope diamond. They suggested um, A, that these diamonds come from, came from 700 kilometers deep, which was a revelation to most people, but also that the boron that gives rise to the blue color comes from Earth's surface. So in other words, you've got sufficient boron transported 700 kilometers back down into the Earth to make diamonds that are then erupted back onto the Earth's surface. So that's an amazing part of the Earth's boron cycle. So the, the, the boron concentrations don't quite nail it. And so our group decided to test that very intriguing hypothesis using boron isotope ratio measurement. Now, of course, that, that sounds like a really easy thing to do. Um, and of course it is a straightforward idea to think up, but then of course you, it dawns on you, actually that's a tremendously difficult thing to do. And so of course, if you're an academic, the natural thing is to find a really good graduate student. And, and in this case, uh, Margot Regier, who came to the University of Alberta. And Margot is a great graduate student with tremendous energy and enthusiasm. And so I decided to give her the task, this rather difficult task of, okay, let's analyze the boron isotopes in these blue diamonds. And actually, uh, she made it work. And so, so we analyzed the suite, Margot analyzed the suite of 23 blue diamonds. Okay, we weren't given access to the Hope diamond here, but, but actually the, di the blue diamonds that we did analyze, here are the laser tracks made in the diamonds. And these were, there were tens of thousands of dollars worth of diamonds that Margot ran the laser over and, and essentially vaporized parts off to generate this data. The mineral inclusions, I won't dwell on the detail of this, suffice to say that these, these mineral inclusions that you can see using um, spectroscopic techniques here, these characterize these diamonds just as the Carnegie group suspected of being of super deep origin in Earth's lower, uppermost lower mantle. And so when, when Margot analyzed the boron isotope ratios, you can use the ratio of uh, 10 boron to 11 boron, and that's a thumbprint or a fingerprint of where that boron has come from. 
And so we thought, well, we should be able to identify pure seawater has a, which is up here, here's boron isotope ratio normalized to a standard. So this is in fact the part per thousand difference between normal Earth's mantle here, this strange acronym MORB, and seawater. And there's a huge difference in, in between seawater and mid-ocean reef basalt. But it's not seawater that you're transporting down directly, it's rocks that are altered by seawater that are called serpentinites. I'll show you a little image of, of, of that very shortly. And as those serpentinites heat up, their bioanisotopic composition changes and gets less dramatically different, but still different at a stage where they then convert to other minerals. And so analysis of this suite of diamonds showed that while some of the blue diamonds overlap the signature of normal mantle, some of them range into territories that are very much outside of the isotopic composition, the boron isotope composition of normal mantle. And so this gives us our really convincing um, uh, support to that hypothesis that was raised by the Carnegie group that the the, the boron comes from sufficient boron. So this is the signature of sufficient boron being deeply subducted into Earth's mantle. Now, actually, you can read more about that sort of process on the Carnegie website. And in fact, this is uh, coincidentally a, a few weeks ago, a study published by um, uh, Smith et al. And it shows here's the fractured oceanic crust, seawater, ingressing and altering that oceanic crust and then being pushed into the Earth's mantle by subduction and diamonds being made in this diamond factory here in the deep mantle here. And so that uh, th um, this particular study actually used iron isotopes to show just the same process that I've just talked about. So it really does seem as though we've got a whiff of this seawater alteration process happening, uh, be, well, being transported to depth and at 700 kilometers in the Earth making diamonds there before they're erupted back onto Earth's surface. Okay, I think hopefully that's given you a little bit of a flavor of diamonds and diamond science. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Graham. That's fantastic. I'm sure we're having lots of applause. Um, Great, we have some questions. I've been, I've been busy trying to answer as many as I can along the way. Um, I'll just start um, with some questions that I missed and ones that I thought might be better for you to answer anyway. Um, okay, here's, here's one. What does the distribution of cold, deep lithosphere regions tell you about the formation and movement of the continents? That's a very good question, yeah. Um, so the remarkable thing about those cold, deep mantle routes is that they translate with the continents as the continents move across Earth's surface. <clears throat> and so almost all of them, there are some examples where that route has been lost. But the really amazing thing is that the, the processes that led to the formation of those routes early in Earth history made made the roots so strong that they've survived billions of years of being pushed around on Earth's surface. <clears throat> and where, where the diamonds are old, they've dragged those diamonds around as well. So not only are the diamonds deep, but the diamonds have had a pretty interesting ride around Earth's surface on like a bit of a bumper car ride before they then get sampled by the Kimberlite. Okay, thanks. Um... Can kimberlite deposits be found by seismic methods or ground penetrating radar? Yes, they can. Um, the tricky bit is that there is no unique signature of kimberlite because it depends on the host rock that the kimberlite is in. So you've got a kimberlite that might be, if you're lucky, a kilometer across. If you're not so lucky, it might be tens of meters across. And you've got to see that signature within the noise of the whatever country rock. And that country rock might be limestone, it might be granite, it might be basalt. So yes, you, need, you can use those techniques, but usually those techniques come into play after the first kimberlites have been found and the geophysicists are able to establish what the country rock is. Well, actually the geophysicists need the geologists to tell them what the country rock is. And then, and then they do the modeling and then you can, you can work out a signature. There's, there's this famous story where Chuck Fipke, who found the, the Arctic diamonds up in Northern Canada, 
in order to prevent his competitors finding out what the geophysical signature of his Kimberlite pipe was, he put a huge electrical boom around the entire pipe run, run by a generator. And every time a plane flew over by one of the competitors trying to measure that signal, they'd hit the generator and it had scrambled the competitor's signal. Except the problem was that they all went into town one night and got drunk and forgot to leave the generator on. And so someone managed to measure the signal. Okay, um, are new diamonds and kimberlites forming in the mantle today? And will there be new diamond deposits in the future? Almost certainly yes. And in fact, uh, if you watch this space or you watch the space on the Carnegie website, you will read hopefully in the next few weeks, a really exciting study uh, that has been led by Steve Shari. I was lucky enough to be involved in it and Mike's been involved in it along with a number of other Carnegie scientists where um, we relate actually um, super deep diamonds to the presence of, of subduction zones. And we think that the, the fluids that are coming off deep subduction zones that are making super deep diamonds are actually the same fluids that are responsible for, we think anyway, for the generation of deep focus earthquakes. So, so yes, I think diamonds are being made in Earth's mantle today. The, whether kimberlites are being made, that's, well, almost certainly the youngest kimberlite is, is a kimberlite from Kenya that's so young that it's hard to date, but probably a few tens of thousands of years old. But, but kimberlites, very much like London buses, they come in, in, in spates. So, so you get a bunch of them and then you get gaps of a million years or more and then you get some more. So they're very difficult to predict when they're going to appear. Graham, can you share some insights into the sustainability of diamond mining and protective measures like the Kimberley process? Yeah, um, I think so. It, it turns out get, diamond mining, <clears throat> excuse me, is often referred to from many points of view as gentleman's mining, to, to use a very old fashioned term, but because it is relatively clean compared to most other types of mining, it, it's certainly not. Um, undamaging to the environment. I would never argue that. But it turns out that there's research being done <clears throat> at a number of places, including the University of Alberta, where some of our mineralogists are making the case that actually you can have a positive, either a carbon neutral or a very positive offset in your carbon budget by mining the kimberlite, because the, the kimberlite itself is an extremely magnesium rich rock. And the, the magnesium rich minerals like olivine in there very readily alter to a mineral called brucite, and the brucite very readily alters to a magnesium carbonate called magnesite. And that carbonate draws down large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, the unfortunate thing in Canada is that because temperatures are so low, the reaction rate's not fast, but in places like Africa, the reaction rate's very much faster. And so there's very good potential for using kimberlite mine spoil tips as drawdown sites for CO2. Um, the Kimberlite, Kimberley process question is a very deeply involved one. Um, and um, suffice to say that, that there are methods for tracing the origins of diamonds. They're very tough. We try to use our trace element methods to do that. Those methods are still in their infancy, but I think, I think diamonds are actually probably less of a problem now these days to contain and to identify the source of than uh, other minerals. For instance, most of the, the, the um, tantalum in the capacitors in our cell phones come, probably comes from places that, that when we examine the political regimes and the conditions of mining, we, we'd rather that they didn't either come from those places or certainly that, that those minerals weren't mined in the way that they're mined. So that's, that's a very involved issue that would probably take be far too long to get to the bottom of it, but it's a great question. How common are mineral inclusions in diamonds? I, I, I wanna know the answer to that myself. <laughs> um, yeah, that, I, I think quite common. I mean, so, so one of the, when a, especially when a big diamond's discovered that the, the, the several things you wanna know other than how big it is, it, it, has it got color to it? Because a, a big diamond of the right color makes that a tremendously val valuable object. But the other issue is 
What's the inclusion content? Because there's, those inclusions can completely spoil the cutting of a really big diamond. And in fact, they're often the limiting feature because around the inclusions, you get cracks and things like that. So and I, I, I can't give you a number on that. What I, what I can give you an impression for, though, is Steve Shirey and I and uh, my colleague Thomas Starkle went to pick diamonds in Brazil uh, probably about a year and a half ago, something like that. And, um, and we sat down and spent several days picking through large piles of diamonds and the super deep diamonds from that part of Brazil there was barely a diamond that did not have an inclusion. It was quite interesting, actually. So, so it depends where you are. I mean, there are diamonds from some parts of the world where inclusions are very rare, and, 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 you'll, and that's one of the reasons that you struggle to find inclusion studies from those areas. And then there are other places like Juina, which you know as well as I, Mike, are, are, are just, to, to, to use the pun, just mines of, 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 of inclusions. So it depends on where which deposit you look at. That's great. I was going to type an answer to that one earlier, but my answer was going to be pretty common sometimes. <laughs> so not very quantitative, but thanks. Um, okay, let me see here. Let me go down a little bit. Okay, what analytical tools have been used so far to study the fluids inside the diamonds? Yeah, very good question. Um, so we, as a field, have benefited tremendously from the evolution of very high quality microscopes being hooked up to non-destructive spectroscopic techniques. So some of the best and most informative are infrared spectroscopy. There's a technique called FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, and Raman spectroscopy in particular, that are really the go-to tools to first look at the inclusions. Because, to, <coughs> excuse me, to do to do the rest of what we want to do on these diamonds requires doing nasty things to them that often their owners don't like. For instance, breaking them or rastering their surface with a laser and evaporating them. And so <clears throat> the, the more information that you can extract with a non-destructive spectroscopic technique like infrared spectroscopy or uh, Raman spectroscopy that, that, that measures the shift of light scattered from, from uh, the inclusions, then, then the more information you can gather without breaking the diamond. In fact, with Raman spectrum, spectroscopy, you can also, you can do really cool things like measure the residual strain next to the diamond, at the diamond inclusion interface and make a first order estimate of what depth that diamond came from. So, and, and that, this, this field's evolving. There are now parts of these really big synchrotron facilities um, are now devoted to, be, to, 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 to examining in, in much more detail diamond, either using micro x-ray techniques or, or high energy infrared spectroscopic techniques as well. So the we've managed to get synchrotron time just because of the interest and publicity that's come out of some of these super deep diamond studies actually. Thanks. Here's one. There was actually a couple of questions related to this, so I'll, I'll ask this one. How do you, as academics, work with mining companies? For example, your advisor who discovered the mine in Lesotho. Do you share in the proceeds? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> the, the answer to that is no. <laughs> I mean, so what I what what I forgot to say is that so those those, those um, super valuable $50 million diamonds. The amazing thing about those is that there's no problem selling those. I mean, they, they sell like iPhones. I mean, in, in, in the new version of the iPhone, it's amazing the number of people around with the money to buy those. But as academics, no, I, I, um, I, we, we, we don't. We do it for the love of the science, really. So we, we um, are sometimes given uh, small pieces of very large stones. If you work with the GIA, the Gemological Institute of America, they have unbelievably valuable samples that pass through their offices for verification purposes. And so they, their scientists have unique opportunities to at least examine with a non-destructive methodology uh, inclusions and, and, and parts of those stones and then there's always the option to acquire stones from owners subsequently but no um 
I think I, I, there's, a, there's a saying in economic geology, which is um, never make the geologist the CEO of your company because they're too passionate about the rocks and the minerals. We're, I, I'm probably the type example of someone who's um, a disaster financially. Here's a question I'm interested in what your answer is going to be as well. What is the dominant source of carbon in the 700 kilometer deep diamond factory? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's that's an excellent question. Um, I, I think that's a that's a picture that we're still painting. So there is, um, if you look at the the three to four hundred kilometer deep diamond factory, there's abundant evidence that most of that carbon comes from the subducting slabs that's transporting sufficient carbon down to those depths. When you hit the seven hundred kilometer mark, that that sufficient signature is not as clear. It's certainly there in some diamonds. So for instance, the blue diamonds that Margot analyzed, they have really quite light ca um, carbon isotope contents. We use the carbon isotopes as a thumbprint of crustal carbon. So generally light carbon isotopes in general are indicative of crustal origins and heavier isotopic compositions are, are more indicative of mantle origins. And, and the really deep 700 kilometer population seem to have populations that are very difficult to tell from normal mantle carbon, and they seem to have also populations that might just be subducted carbon too. But I, I think, ask me again in two years time, mm -hmm. well, I'll have a better answer, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Um, a few more. How do you analyze and define the diamond inclusions? Yeah, uh, I think the biggest challenge is deciding what you want to do with the inclusions. So having identified them um, by, say, some non-destructive technique like, like Raman spectroscopy or infrared spectroscopy, you, you've then got to decide, OK, am I allowed to break this diamond to release that inclusion? How big is that inclusion? Uh, because those factors dictate what you can do with that inclusion. And because most of the processes subsequent to that involve the destruction of the inclusion. And so, so yeah, it, it, if you want to analyze strontium isotopes or, or other, even almost any other isotope, then you've got to dissolve those inclusions and run them on a mass spectrometer. And so now we're at the stage of, I think, being, in, imaginative so that we can think of the ways of, of think of ways of extracting the most information from a 30 to 100 micron inclusion that's that's the challenge so it's a it's a compromise you have to make a decision as to what information you're really after at the moment that there maybe they'll come a day when people far cleverer than I am invent methods where you can shine some light source and extract all this information just like that from but um, fr from an inclusion and, and cut out the months, if not years of work that we put into this right now. And that's called a tricorder, by the way. Um, <laughs> and pink diamonds, what, what makes a, a diamond pink? Um, yeah, lots of good questions. So for a long time, that was not well known and, and there were a lot of options circulating. It, 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 the pink color in many minerals can come from an element such as manganese or cobalt. And, and, and some people had proposed that for, uh, for pink diamonds, but as, as soon as methods came along to reliably analyze the trace elements in diamonds, then that, those options quickly got knocked on the head. And so it's now thought that the pink color for most diamonds comes from very intense, fine deformation lamellae almost kink bands, if you like, in the diamond structure that act in a way to uh, refract the light in a certain way that, that will give you this, this pink color to the diamond. That's, that's kind of the, the best basic answer I can give you to the pink color. But yeah, that's on, probably only recently being resolved in the last five years, that question. Are you good for one or two more? Yeah, sure, if people have questions. I oh yeah, there's an endless stream. Um, Crustal carbonates, CaCO3, most likely are being subducted deep into the mantle. Does this explain the calcium-rich mineral inclusions in diamonds? Huh. Uh, yes, quite quite possibly. I mean, that that I, again, that depends on. I think we're at the stage where 
the discovering the super deep inclusions has really made us revisit, okay, we need to know a lot more about the stability of these minerals before we can completely confirm that, that, that that's the case. And so, so the great advantage of somewhere like Carnegie is that they've got some of the world's best big experimental presses where, where they can do um, experimental synthesis and stability studies on those phases to really address those questions. But at the moment, it very much looks like the carbonate that is, that is found as inclusions in the diamonds does seem to be of crustal origin at the moment. Okay, here's one. Does the data collected about the mantle provide any insights into the changes in mantle composition? For example, volcanic eruptions give insights into magma composition. Yes. Again, excellent question. Um, yeah, I so, so the beauty of diamonds is that they, once something's trapped in a diamond, then, then essentially that's it in terms of its chemical signature. They're beautiful time capsules. And that is one of the reasons we invested a lot of time and effort in dating diamonds is because once you can tell at what stage a certain mineral or a chemical signature was trapped in a diamond, then that gives you little pinpoints back through Earth history to enable you to do these temporal studies of whether things have changed throughout Earth, Earth's history. And so uh, we have just we completed a study as part of as part of the Deep Carbon Observatory that was published a year or so ago, looking at the the potential evolution of carbon isotopes through time in diamonds. And we're now at the stage of, of, of also being able to then interrogate other chemical signatures in those diamonds to see whether those two have undergone any change as the earth evolves. Because possibly what's behind the question is that yes, the earth does evolve, it cools down and, and the, the modes of plate tectonic cycling can change, supercontinents aggregate and disperse. And, and all those things ultimately have a feedback effect on the chemical signature of Earth's mantle and diamond is perhaps, well, those of us that study it would like to think it's the foremost mineral to look at those temporal changes. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop it there. Thanks so much, Graham, for a, a really wonderful talk and very clear, very clear answers to all those great questions. Um, we, everyone can give uh, Graham another round of applause. I'm going to stay online and, and just try to shoot some answers off to some of the, the questions that remain. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in having your question answered, uh, you, can, you can stay on, I think. Um, I guess, I guess um, our IT specialists will, will tell me if I'm <laughs> telling you something wrong. Uh, but I'll stay on for a few minutes and try, to, and try to answer some questions. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me and thanks to anybody who tuned in and spent their time listening to some science. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay. Did you see the one from YouTube in the chat, Mike? I didn't, maybe. I don't know. A brown and yellow diamond. Um, what about I what about yellow diamonds? Um Okay, um, gonna, can I go ahead and try to answer a few of these? Is that okay? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Oh, you going to? You're typing them? Just yeah, clear. I'm typing. I'm typing them. All right, I will stop the stream on YouTube then at this point. Okay. Yeah.